2 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul said, I know a man who is caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or not, I don't know. The fact that my son-in-law is still here, <laughs> he's going to the game <laughs> presently. He may be leaving now. <laughs> But uh, I so appreciate, I, I don't know a fan like him, and it's, it's so cool. I'm, I'm a fan, but I'm not a fan like him. <laughs> and it's, but it's so cool. I love to watch fans watch the Broncos. That's one of the fun things in, in my wife. Is Nancy, are you here? She's not here. Okay. <laughs> Let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. One thing I've asked of the Lord, this is what I seek. One thing I have asked of the Lord, this is what I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Who is it that you seek? We seek the Lord our God. Do you seek him with all your heart? Amen, Lord. Have mercy. Do you seek him with all your soul? Amen, Lord. Have mercy. Do you seek him with all your mind? Amen, Lord. Have mercy. Do you seek him with all your strength? Amen. Christ the Messiah. Have mercy. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Good morning. So I've got a trivia question for the rest of us. Okay, if Gene is, is nine hours ahead in Israel right now, does he already know who won the game? <laughs> so where you, where, what your understanding is of the space-time continuum might, might inform that. Uh, Brian mentioned it. I want to again invite every, every one of us uh, that are male of the species to uh, let's come together for a hearty breakfast next Saturday morning. And some of the things I'm going to mention this morning, I'm going to talk more about, uh, but particularly Jesus' humanity and, and the difference that makes for us as men. I find the longer that I walk by faith in the God of all creation, a God that I cannot see, I am less concerned about proving to myself or anyone else that he is there. My wife, Nancy, doesn't expect me to prove my love to her as evidence that she exists any more than God does. I'm going to give a quote that is really meaningful to me, and I think it's meaningful for someone here this morning. I'm not quite sure what it has to do with the rest of my remarks this morning, but it's by Henry Nouwen. And you can make your own application. There is a twilight zone in our hearts that we ourselves cannot see. Even when we know quite a lot about ourselves, our gifts and weaknesses, our ambitions and aspirations, our motives and our drives, large parts of ourselves remain in the shadow of consciousness. This is a very good thing. We will always remain partially hidden to ourselves. Other people, especially those who love us, can often see our twilight zones better than we ourselves can. The way we are seen and understood by others is different from the way we see and understand ourselves. We will never fully know the significance of our presence in the lives of, of our friends. That's a grace, a grace that calls us not only to humility, but to a deep trust in those who love us. It is the twilight zones of our hearts where true friendships are born. Last week, Gene left us with these words, some of the last ones he, he said, receive forgiveness, be a person of hope, help restore the kingdom of God now. That was really good news. That's what I remembered from what he said, and those words are still ringing in my ears. But in 587 BCE, about 600 years before the Messiah came to the planet, the exiled Hebrew nation sat on the banks of the Euphrates River lamenting, singing this lament. It was not good news for them at that time. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lyres, for there, there our captors record of the songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. 
The question I have for us this morning is how? Like the exiled people of God, how shall we sing the, the Lord's song in a foreign land? It's no secret that the United States is no longer the nation it once was. Even though millions of Americans claim a cultural Christianity, the biblical worldview has waned within our culture. As the culture continues to drift from its Judeo-Christian moorings, it's as though we're now exiles in our own land. Have you felt it? Do you feel it? How do we live with the fact that most people overwhelmingly do not share an overarching narrative about the nature of God, marriage, human life, sexuality, and human freedom? How do we re-engage with our culture? How does the gospel go forward in a pluralistic, postmodern, post-Christian society? How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? The title of Newsweek's April 2009 cover story, this was five years ago, by John Meacham says it all. The end of Christian America, that was the cover story. John Meacham, a Pulitzer Prize winning author, made it clear that he was not saying that the Christian God is dead. Rather, that Christians are exerting less force in America than ever before. Quote, while we remain a nation decisively shaped by religious faith, writes Meacham, our politics and our culture are, in the main, less influenced by movement and arguments of an explicitly Christian character than they were even five years ago. He said that five years ago. Meacham is correct. Public perceptions of Christians are overwhelmingly negative. Church attendance is rapidly declining, and Christian voices are less persuasive in public spaces than in the past. In short, the Christian faith is quickly losing traction in Western culture. And it's not only a result of Christians acting, acting unchristian, as significant as that is. It's because we haven't recognized our new reality and adapted to it. We must grieve and mourn this loss. But within this loss, within this liminal time, there is a great opportunity. Before a resurrection, something must die. Eugene Peterson put it this way, pain isn't the worst thing. Being hated isn't the worst thing. Being separated from the one you love isn't the worst thing. Death isn't the worst thing. The worst thing is failing to deal with reality and becoming disconnected from what is actual. The worst thing is trivializing the honorable, desecrating the sacred. What I do with my grief affects the way you handle your grief. Together we form a community that deals with death and other loss in the context of God's sovereignty, which is expressed full, finally in resurrection. We don't become mature human beings by getting lucky or cleverly circumventing loss, and certainly not by avoidance and distraction. Learn to lament. Learn this lamentation. Take up your cross. It prepares us and those around us for resurrection. Historically, believers have recognized that God's story, his grand narrative, unfolds in four parts or like four acts to a, a magnificent play. Creation is act one. Actually, some say even before creation is really act one. But just for the sake of this morning, creation is act one. Act two is the fall. Act three is redemption. Act four is restoration and, and consummation. In the recent past, however, some have articulated the story in terms of only two acts, two parts, fall and redemption. This truncated story doesn't fully explain what God is up to in our time. It's a part of the story, but that's not the story. It's a big part of the story. This application of only two chapters doesn't provide a cogent vision for a believer's life with God now. And as well, I'll, I'll speak more later, millions, this is one of the reasons why millions and millions of millennials are leaving the church. But they're not coming back. That's the difference between my generation 
You may have been a prodigal, I was, okay, raised in the church, raised in the faith. But when I got at 18 years old, I left and I left, I didn't just leave home. It was a paradigm shift for me because I had not embraced the one with whom we have to do. I always believed in God, but I never believed him. There wasn't some, someone I could connect to. But now more than ever before, millions of millennials are leaving the church, but they are not returning. But there's a reason for it, I think, a good reason. And they're not to be, uh, how should I say, scolded for leaving. By ignoring God's design in creation, which gives human beings the ability to reflect his image in one's gifts and vocational calling, by leaving out the restoration work of the Messiah in the here and now, we've taken away the coherence of the story. By placing the story of the gospel, which began to be told to human beings at least 5,000 years ago, not 500 years ago, or even 2,000 years ago. But by placing the story of the gospel back into the context of God's whole story, we're better able to understand the with God life now. I was introduced to the with God life now 42 years ago. And I've never gotten over this one who I heard his voice and I continue to hear his voice when I really listen because he rarely shouts. John Eldridge says this, we have lived so long with a propositional approach to Christianity, we've nearly, nearly lost its true meaning. Our rationalistic approach to life, which has dominated Western culture for hundreds of years, has left us, left us with a faith that is barely more than mere fact-telling. Modern evangelicalism reads like an IRS 1040 form. It's true. All the data is there, but it doesn't take your breath away. We have a calling to belong to God and to participate in his creative, redemptive, and restorative work in the world. Now, we receive and respond to this calling as more than simply individual partners of a congregation that we call Cornerstone, but as members of the Messiah's body connected to and dependent on each other within the broad believing community in the world. Nancy and I have had the privilege to meet with underground church believers and, and study the story in Beijing. We've had the privilege to actually study with Catholic charismatics in Rome and with a Romanian Orthodox priest in Belfast. And now I have the privilege of studying this story with believing Jews in Boulder. God is really up to something, big time. Again, in 587, 500, almost 600 years before the Messiah came, the prophet Jeremiah spoke these words to his people as they lamented on the banks of the Euphrates. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in answering the question, how shall we sing the Lord's song? Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile, from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses, live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Seeking the welfare of our city and culture requires significant shifts in our thinking, our posture, and our practices within the broader believing community of Boulder, the United States, and the world. But we must remember that new life always comes in a new season. I believe that as exiles, we must continue to make a shift from a theological overfocus on the future to a focus on the present. The popular Left Behind series comes to mind here. Make your own application. We must continue to shift from an over-focus on heaven to more of a focus on earth. 
We worship Jesus Christ, the Messiah, as God, fully God, in the flesh. But we must also bring into focus the Messiah's humanity. I'll speak more of that to us together, men, on Saturday morning. And, and the connection it makes to our work and why it really matters. We must reaffirm Christ's commitment to the fecund earth, a commitment to social justice and righting wrongs, continuing to help the poor and the vulnerable, defending the rights of women and children and of those who are powerless to change the very institutions that keep them that way. How do we know if this portrait that we are trying to paint here at Cornerstone is from the Holy Spirit? Missiologist Robert Greer's work is helpful at this point. Of course, not all portraits should be automatically deemed legitimate. To do so would allow into our thinking what is not true to the reality of God and his good creation. Distinguishing genuine from false requires the presence of a little theological finesse. All portraits should be, you ready? New word. Christo Messiah centric. <laughs> Christo Messiah centric. Grounded in the facticity of the Messiah event, his life, his incarnation, his crucifixion, his resurrection and ascension, present in scripture and in conformity to the early councils. With this in mind, we would likely need three additional characteristics to accurately recognize portraits as painted by the Holy Spirit. Number one, a commitment to the statement, Jesus is Lord. Quite likely the earliest of the apostolic creeds. And the two great commandments, loving God and loving one's neighbor with all one's heart, soul, mind, and strength. Statements located in the Shema and central to Jesus' teaching. Romans 10.9 says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 1 Corinthians 12.3, therefore I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. In the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is a pledge of allegiance I make every morning of my life. I pledge allegiance to the one and only God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be in your heart. And Jesus' own words from Matthew 22, 37 through 40. He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and four, first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, some of us get stuck. I actually had a student come to me one time and said, okay, so, so if I love God, then he'll love me. No, we love him because he loves us. I had that conversation just yesterday with my three grandsons talking about being loved by God. I didn't just flip a switch one day and say, I'm going to become, as a, as a young 19-year-old Marine, I want to become a really religious guy. I can't, this was 42 years ago. I was ambu ambushed by the one who is alive. For the first time in my life, I met a man I respected up here who was in love unashamedly, unabashedly with the living Messiah. And I said, I've never, I've never seen and experienced the living Lord in a way that matters to me. He is Lord. He is alive right now. Right now. Some of us are looking at our clocks. He's alive right now, for real. Number two, Cornerstone must continue to have a well-developed awareness of the social and spiritual concerns of our city and the world and how this awareness either conforms to or opposes the notions of Jesus is Lord. 
and the two great commandments. And number three, a recognition that the Holy Spirit, listen carefully, please, does not exclusively speak singularly to an individual, but rather to a body of believers. This final characteristic carries within it an important implication. A spirit-driven portrait of Christ as the Messiah will not remain restricted to an isolated group or individual, but rather will resonate with the broad believing community. Acts 13, 1 and 2. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Serene, Menean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, while they were worshiping, there was solidarity and it was verified through the church. The Holy Spirit says, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. We are not simply satisfied with doing the most good for some people at Cornerstone or even the most good for most people in Boulder. We believe that the Messiah is calling Cornerstone to be about the most good for all people in every place. Not just the most good for some people, not the most good for most people, the most good for all people. You begin to make your own application of that. We stand in solidarity with and for the entire human race. The scripture tells us God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should re reach repentance. He desires all mankind to be saved. He desires that. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. However, lest I be misunderstood, C.S. Lewis said, the happiness which God designs for his higher creatures is the happiness of being freely, voluntarily united to him and to each other in the ecstasy of love and delight compared with which the most rapturous love between a man and a woman on this earth is mere milk and water. And for that, they must be free. Of course, God knew what would happen if they used their freedom the wrong way. Apparently, he thought it worth the risk. I'm so glad he did. African-American author and human rights advocate Bell Hooks says in her book, Outlaw Culture, it's interesting the way in which one has to balance life because you have to know when to let go and when to pull back. There's always some liminal as opposed to subliminal space in between which is harder to inhabit because it never feels as safe as moving from one extreme to another. The Hebrews may have never felt comfortable during their 70 years as exiles. And perhaps neither will we. Rediscovering how to sing the Lord's song as exiles in our own land may never feel safe, but I'm convinced that as we continue to seek the welfare of our city and culture, others will continue, continue to hear and experience the sweetest music they've ever heard. Do you hear the song? It's a beautiful song. People around the world are hearing it. We're learning to play the song, to listen to the song and cooperate with his song in a way I've never experienced before. But as I mentioned a few minutes ago, there are some very significant challenges ahead. 59% of millennials will leave the church and Christianity as they now know it. Former Vineyard Church planner and now Anglican bishop Todd Hinner was, Hunter was interviewed for his book by Christianity Today, uh, his book Christianity, Christianity Beyond Belief. And um, it's obvious from his book that he uh, he sets aside evidentialist apologetics in favor of a behavioral apologetic. And this was the question he was asked, what's the role of apologetics? I don't hear people asking, how do I need know Jesus rose from the dead? 
I haven't been asked that question lately. But I worked at CU for 16 years some time ago, and I was asked that question a lot back in the 70s and 80s. Those were the kinds of conversations. But I don't, I don't get a lot of people asking me that question anymore. But, but Hunter goes on to say, he goes, I do hear young people inside and outside of the church asking, is the church a force for good or for evil? The new atheism is questioning the essential goodness of the church. I don't set aside evidentialist apologetics. I just see people coming into a community more experientially and then start asking, will you show me what we believe and why we believe it? What makes this thing tick? We still answer those questions, but simply later in the process. The average person doesn't live out of data and propositions. They live out of their imaginations. Hunter goes on to say, he goes, when I almost moved to Washington State to play rookie league baseball, which animated me, what animated me was my dream of playing in the majors. I knew the facts of baseball, I knew the rules, I knew the history and the great players, but what, I, what fueled me was my imagination. Stories create imagination, and imagination creates possibility. And again, this is where Eugene Peterson's work about the power of story to shape imagination has been so helpful. He says this, really hang, hang in here with me, millennials especially. If you genuinely think Christianity is a story about going to heaven when you die, it's no accident that fostering discipleship is like pulling teeth. How do people move to the bigger life with God now and secure death story? And I like what, what Hunter says here. In our story, heaven is not the goal, it's the destination. We're going to reign with God forever in the renewed heaven and renewed earth. That's our destination. But the goal now is God's image in us being restored and being transformed to our original design in following Jesus and living out our purpose to restore God's good creation. And I love it when he goes, if my dream of playing baseball had come true, I wouldn't have called my dad and said, Dad, I'm going to New York. No, I would have said I got drafted by the Yankees. New York is not the goal, but it's the, it's the destination. Worship team, you can come out now, please. In much of the last 70 years, at least, evangelicalism, we've asked people to cross a finish line. So it went something like this. Give people some information that we call apologetics. Give them some more information and give them some more information. Then, okay, you get it. You need to make a decision now and you get to go to heaven when you die. What I prefer to see is we do need some information, okay? But then enculturation, people need to be a part of something. Saying the prayers, there are, there are prayers that the scriptures, I just read this week actually, the power of, of reading sacred text. I posted this on Facebook. There was a rabbi that said we need to read sacred text to put God's word on our heart. And then when God breaks our heart, the words fall inside. We need to become very familiar with sacred text. I'm going to read and close my remarks with, by reading Romans chapter, part of Romans chapter 8 in the message. If you've never read Romans chapter 8, let me encourage you to read it today. In the message, it sings. It sings. Read sacred text because your heart will be broken. If it's never been broken, it will be. I have experienced heartache.
in ways I never thought I would. In the last three years, if God's word keeps falling into the cracks as he has broken my heart, and he's used many of you in this room to help mend the broken places. The story is not about coming up to a finish line, but to a starting line. It's the beginning of the adventure. Some of you are here this morning. Perhaps you've never begun the great adventure of following Jesus the Messiah. He welcomes you to begin, to begin that journey. Some of us have been on the journey for decades. It's great to see gray hair, the older I get, especially. More than ever before, whether you're a millennial or older, you need friends to run with. Friends that love you and aren't impressed by you. They see the twilight zone. <laughs> Maybe experience it with you. But I invite you to become a follower of him. Can you now see that the big intention of God for the earth and what he was doing through Christ the Messiah and Pentecost and creating, in creating the people of God, are you willing to join that family and take up that family's cause through following Jesus? Let me read. Go ahead, Doc. I love that when you play in the background. Especially now. Romans chapter 8. Don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is to give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's an adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's Spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who He is and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we're going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. That's why I don't think there's any comparison with the present hard times and the coming good times. The created world itself can hardly wait for what's coming next. Everything in creation is being more or less held back. God reigns it in until both creation and all the creatures are ready and can be released at the same moment into the glorious times ahead. Meanwhile, the joyful anticipation deepens. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even to point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness. Not bullying threats, not backstabbing. Not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. 
They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing, living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us.